And I said, there's only one place on earth where this snail has actually been eradicated. And that was right here in Florida from 1969 to 1975. Well, I'm happy to say there's still only one place on earth where the giant African snail has been eradicated. And now we've done it twice. So this is a huge day for us. Uh, the, the difference in the program size and scale is from the 69 program to now, they're not even comparable. We had collected a total, a grand total of 17,000 snails in that program in the early 70s. We've collected over 168,000 snails on this program over the last 11 years. So I started this program as the leader of our exotic survey, pest survey team called the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey. That's a team made up of federal and state regulators that go out and their sole purpose in life is to look for exotic pests, uh, areas that are vulnerable in Florida, track them as they're moving around the world and try and intercept early enough for us to do something about it. Once the program got up and running for the first five years, I worked on the research and development side of things, trying to come up with better ways uh, to eradicate this pest, better ways to find them, uh, better baits, and then for the last six years, I've been the director. So I've been on all sides of this program, from the field, to the lab, to policy. So um, I feel uh, I'm really invested in this program. I've always been invested in this program. So today is a really, really exciting day for me to get up here and, and to be able to talk about this. So why don't I take this opportunity to kind of reintroduce this pest. So this snail gets up to eight inches long. It lays thousands and thousands of eggs every year. It feeds on over 500 plants. It'll eat the stucco on your walls. So it'll eat your plants and it'll eat your house. It carries a parasite that causes meningitis in humans and other mammals. And on top of all that, this is a major, major trade issue. Our trade partners do not want this pest. So it was absolutely imperative that we come in and eradicate this thing so that it didn't impact our international trade. Now, another interesting fact about these snails is they're actually hermaphrodites. So when two snails come together and mate, two snails come away pregnant. On top of that, they can actually self-fertilize. So one snail can lead to a whole new population of snails. So we literally have to get every single snail to eradicate the population. So there's a lot of different things that went into this program that really made it a success. I think one of the biggest ones, and this is where most other countries fail, is stable long-term funding. Typically in a fruit fly program, some of you may be familiar with our Oriental Fruit Fly program down in Homestead in 2018 and in 2015. We can go in there and we can eradicate in six months. We've got traps, we've got lures, we've got sex pheromones that attract them. We didn't have any of that for these snails. This is a long-term eradication program. This has been tried all over the world, in the Caribbean, in South America, in Asia, the South Pacific, Hawaii, Guam, I could go on. None of them have succeeded. And a big part of that's funding. You have to have the vision. You've got to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it's a long way. This was 11 years coming. Collaborations huge we couldn't have done it without it this has been one of the most collaborative projects i've ever worked on from the federal to the state to the county to the municipalities to the homeowners associations the landscape organizations the nursery industry everybody was on board and everybody was pulling in the same direction uh, it was just uh, incredible to see everybody get behind something and how much progress we could make and how quickly outreach was enormous we flooded the market with the right information before the wrong information got out there. We had billboards, we had bus signs, we had uh, trailers in the movie theaters, we did radio ads, and we refreshed it year after year. We would refresh that and say, what is an area we're not hitting? What is a demographic or uh, an age group or something that might not be aware of this that we need to freshen up this message? And year after year, we did that. And that led to if you see the map over here, 98% of those core populations were reported by the public. 98%. So 
So if we had not had that out there, if we had not had the public literally working for us on this, there's no way we could have done this. And then one of the most important things that really developed over time in this program is our data collection. When we started this, we literally had paper maps in our hands. And they were accurate. We had details in there. We talked about, you know, you'd have the parcel map, you'd see uh, there'd be a little drawing showing where the air conditioning unit was, and there'd be a note saying, back here is where the snails tend to hide. By the end of the program, we had an integrated GIS system with our database that would update 1,500 maps every single night, which would then go out to handheld units to our folks out in the field with every detail on every property that we had gone out and surveyed. So the data, owning the data, having that data collection uh, and that ability was, was huge as well. So this is a big day in Florida, in the United States. It's a big day in our fight against this never-ending fight against invasive species. So this is what we want. So I'm going to be up a little bit later. I'm going to give more details about the program itself, and we'll be able to take questions. But until then, we have some other VIPs that are going to come up and say a few words. Thank you. I can talk loud, too. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. I am Nikki Freed, Florida's Commissioner of Agriculture, and this truly is an exciting day for our state, uh, for our country. And I cannot thank Dr. Smith enough for what you and your team have done. Um, you can see the passion that he has for, for his job and for the importance of this program. And of course, all of the individuals that are here with us today who have been part of this program, we could not have done this without you. Uh, including our, our canines, uh, which I want to tell you, as now three years into my position, I did not know we had canines on staff. Um, so this is very exciting to know and, and that this is really, truly a partnership. Um, and also, Mr. Miranda, thank you for all that you have done. We are so grateful to have you here today on behalf of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Because as Dr. Smith said, this is truly a partnership with all of our federal, state, local partnerships, and of course, the community. Because this eradication was truly a collaborative achievement, it is a testament of our state and federal partnership and shared commitment to this program that got us to this point here today and encouraging the eradication of this giant African land snail. And it sure is nice to have good news for once to share in the state of Florida when it comes to uh, eradication programs. I cannot be more proud of the work that you have done in our division of plant industry and our partnership with USDA since the giant African snails were first found in Miami in 2011. This marks only, as Dr. Smith was saying, the second time in history that these invasive pests have been eradicated. With Florida's division of plant industry, the first in the world to have declared the eradication after the outbreak was discovered in 1969. We are so fortunate in Florida to have such a proactive and experienced team with our Division of Plant Industry that works closely in partnership with USDA to prevent, detect, and treat invasive threats in our entire state. Because unfortunately, as we saw with the most recent outbreak, we must stay vigilant when it comes to the smuggling of invasive pests and species into our state. Florida is a major port of entry for both people and goods. And with that comes increased risk that the invasive pests, species, or diseases will be brought in both intentionally and unintentionally. And given our subtropical climate, non-native species that may not be able to thrive or cause damage in other parts of the country or the world can wreak havoc on Florida's native species, natural environment, and of course, our agriculture industry. That's why the eradication of this highly invasive agriculture pest was vitally important to protecting Florida's nearly $150 billion agriculture industry. Without eradication, the giant African snail could have resulted in major export and trade implications from our growers already struggling to face the unfair foreign trade practices, extreme weather conditions, and major market disruptions due to COVID-19. Because rightfully so, other countries don't want to take that risk to spread of such an invasive species when importing products from our impacted areas. 
On the other side of that same coin is why we work with our Division of Plant Industry and the USDA to do implement safeguards on the import of foreign products that have a high risk of carrying invasive pests that could devastate our agriculture industry and in turn devastate our economy here in the state. Agriculture is the second largest economic driver in Florida and we must do everything we can to protect this vital industry and the safe and secure domestic food supply that it supports. And that is why we are committed to doing our job day in and day out and making sure that the Florida Department of Agriculture and Community Services does its part to protect agriculture and the beautiful environment that we have here in the state of Florida. So I'm honored to be here today with all of you to mark this special occasion. And on behalf of Florida's agriculture industry, and quite honestly, the entire state of Florida, thank you, Dr. Smith, and our entire division of plant industries team, along with Mr. Miranda, and our partners at the USDA, to your dedication for protecting Florida from a base of threats to human health, our environment, and our economy. Congratulations again to this historic eradication. Richard Miranda. I am the State Plant Health Director for the United States Department of Agriculture. I am honored and indeed thrilled to represent USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, at today's eradication celebration. Commissioner Freed, thank you for the invitation to be here today. And on behalf of U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, APHIS Administrator Mr. Kevin Shea, and Deputy Administrator uh, for PPQ, Dr. Osama Elisi, I'd like to thank Commissioner Freed and her, her uh, remarkable staff at the Division of Plant Industry for being such incredible partners in this endeavor and in all others in which we are engaged. I would also like to thank my own staff in PPQ Florida for their hard work and dedication in this effort. I'd like to thank Miami-Dade, Broward Counties, as well as the municipalities therein and the multiple universities and agency cooperators that assisted in this effort over the years. But most importantly, I want to thank the general public in South Florida, without whose support we would not have been successful, as Trevor well said just a few minutes ago. I'm going to steal a few seconds to recognize APHIS's former national policy manager for this program, Andrew Wilds. Andrew worked on this program from the very beginning, he was a passionate and effective advocate for the continuous funding of this program, always ensuring that our decision makers knew of its importance. Sadly, Andrew passed away earlier this year, far too young. He would have, he would have been thrilled to be here with us today. What we're announcing today is no small feat. It marks over 10 years of dedication and commitment by our two agencies working collaboratively with other stakeholders to safeguard the natural, commercial, and ornamental agricultural resources in Florida. Aside from the public health concern this snail posed, its establishment would have resulted in international trade restrictions that would have crippled our economy. We are extremely proud to have protected the public, our domestic growers and exporters in Florida, and farmers across the U.S. from that fate. This all began, as Trevor said, about a decade ago, just a few blocks from where we're all standing here today, when two alert residents reported a strange looking snail. That report helped us discover the first infestation of the giant African land snail in Florida since the 1970s. Today, we celebrate the successful eradication of this highly invasive pest for the second time and highlight for the third time this morning that Florida is the only place in the world where that has been accomplished, period, full stop. Having said that, our two agencies could not have accomplished this without great collaboration from a few partners. Those include APHIS's Agricultural Research Service, several municipalities within Miami-Dade and Broward Counties, the Miami-Dade and Broward County governments themselves, many homeowners associations, landscape companies, nurseries, 
but most importantly, the general public, which enthusiastically supported our goal of eradicating the snail. Aside from those uh, alliances, this program relied on a unique partnership I'd like to highlight. There are ecological and climatic re uh, realities in South Florida that make finding these snails very difficult. Not only does the coloration of these snails afford them natural camouflage, but when it's hot, something I hear happens a lot in South Florida, they burrow six to eight inches underground to stay cool and maintain their moisture. That makes it virtually impossible to find them. To address this problem, we employ canines specially trained at our USDA National Detective Dog Training Center in Georgia to detect the precise scent of this species of snail, even underground. The canines were then partnered with state handlers at DPI and put to work as part of the detection branch in the program. Not only were the canine teams instrumental in detecting these sneaky, slimy snails, but they also helped ensure that core areas were clear before they could be deregulated and declared snail free. Our canine teams were critically important, but formed only a part of a larger compendium of resources needed to eradicate this pest. It was the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services who contributed the lion's share of field resources as well as scientific and technical expertise. APHIS also provided expertise to the eradication effort, along with the stable funding to provide much of those needed resources. Over the last decade, APHIS provided over $19 million toward this effort, with the state of Florida contributing another $4.4 million for a total of $24 million dollars. On the surface, that number may sound shocking to you. However, when measured against the human health threat of meningitis and the ruinous impact this pest poses to our economy, namely the international trade implications, it's well worth that expense. But I want to close with an important message to the residents of Florida and the nation overall. This is a rare and wonderful win for all of us but we will need the public's help to keep this invasive snail out of Florida and the mainland U.S. As previously stated, this is the second time we've battled this specific pest, costing millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars each time. Yet this problem is completely preventable. Giant African land snails can hitchhike into the state with international cargo on planes or ships or on container on sea containers. Both APHIS and Customs and Border Protection have staff at the ports ensuring we protect against commercial pathways for these snails. However, some people try to smuggle them in as food or buy them online as pets. We need the public's help to prevent introduction of invasive pests like this through the pet trade or from the traveling public uh, returning from abroad. Please stay far away from giant African land snails. It is illegal and dangerous to, uh, to agriculture and the environment to import this snail move it intrastate, or even to own it. I want to say that part again. It is illegal to even own this snail in the United States. Although APHIS allows rare exceptions through a permitting process for research facilities that can contain this snail, none of these exceptions apply to the general public. It's simply too dangerous as this snail can carry a parasite that can cause meningitis in humans. So we need your help. We must remain vigilant to keep these snails out of Florida. Please continue to keep an eye out for it. And if you think you see one, or if you come across these snails for sale by individuals or online, please report it immediately to the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Reporting it early is important. We have a proven eradication game plan, but early detection and rapid response are critical elements that make all the difference. We've accomplished a major victory for plant health and human health in Miami-Dade and Broward counties. If we all remain alert, we can ensure this victory holds. I want to thank all of you for being here today. I want to thank Commissioner Nikki Freed for her leadership. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Trevor Smith for his leadership, guidance, and partnership in this program. Thank you. So I mentioned I want to flesh this, uh, I'd like to flesh out uh, some of these numbers you see up here a little bit more. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind about this program is 
from day one, when we found the snail, we went out and collected a population. We brought it back to a quarantine facility in Gainesville. And for 10 years, we studied the biology. We adjusted our tactics accordingly. We've looked at different types of molluscicides and pesticides. We looked at when they were active. Uh, when were they most likely to lay eggs? Where were they most likely to lay eggs? All of that was going on simultaneously while we were in an eradication program. So the science dictated our decisions. And a lot of the things that we did uh, weren't necessarily uh, anything out of the ordinary or requiring a whole bunch of technology. A lot of it was just understanding the snail's biology. So one of the big things we did is we actually helped to beautify the city of Miami by removing debris. So if you went to a property and there was all kinds of debris on the property, the snails can hide under there. You can't get a molluscicide in a bait. You can't get it into them where they are. So for no, free of charge, no cost to the homeowner, we would remove that debris, whether it was green material, old tires, whatever it was, we would go in and remove that. And that allowed us to get into there where the snails were hiding. We also had uh, studies done on how deep a snail had to be buried before it could, you know, it couldn't come back out of the ground. So think about all that debris. Where does it go? It goes to a very special landfill, and it's buried six feet under. The snails cannot dig six feet up. When are the snails most active? They're active at night. So we put together night teams. And that's quite a feat. I mean, just think about the safety hazards just in general. Uh, in a city like this, in a county like this, working at night. But we were able to do that, and a big part of it was because we developed teams, our snail teams, we committed them to certain areas. They got to know the homeowners, they knew their kids, they knew uh, you know, what was going on in their lives, they knew their first names. So for 10 years, 11 years in some cases, we had inspectors walking on these folks' property with virtually no friction. And that's because we developed those relationships. So even coming out at night and being on someone's property looking for snails, we were able to pull that off. And that was an important aspect of it. The night teams were big. We also know that when it rains, the snails come out in numbers. So when there was a rain event, barring lightning, we would send the teams out. And there would be a special push during those uh, rain events to collect snails and to treat for snails. We also had a, a different kinds of research going on into the actual molluscicides used. Not only the most effective, but what is the safest? You know, we're operating in a, in a residential area. What are things we can put out that will kill the snails, but aren't going to affect pets, children, or animals? And a lot of study went into that. A lot of effort went into that. We were able to come up with some excellent formulas that were safe to use in this environment. I mentioned the GIS aspect. I want to say this one more time. We actually had two of our GIS mappers receive the uh, Florida Tax Watch uh, Productivity Award in 2018. Because, again, this is writing script so that a database and a mapping system talk to one another. And you literally can go in and sync your devices, and it uploads everything into the map. When you come out the next morning as a surveyor, it's all there. You've got every bit of information you need. And like I said, it's not just the parcel. Within the parcel, on the parcel, various parts of the area, the areas that are higher risk, we know where the snails are hiding or where they've historically hidden. And then, of course, the canines. There's nothing that makes you feel better when you need to clear a property and say, it's been three years since we found a live snail here. And that's what it takes. We have to go three years without a live snail before we can declare a property free from this pest. It makes you feel a lot better when you've got the dogs and they walk that property one last time and they don't sit. When they see a snail, they sit. When they walk through that property, we know this one's done. And that's how we shrunk this thing over time. We didn't do it in one big blow. We did it a property at a time. Thousands and thousands and thousands of properties. I'll just reiterate one more time the human element of this this never would have worked. The science is great. The dogs are great. All the outreach is great. But if we didn't have the public on our side, if we didn't have homeowners out there looking in their yards and bringing out bags of snails for us, 
if they weren't out there working for us and with us, this never would have worked. It never would have happened. If we didn't have those relationships with those teams working in those environments where they were on that first name basis with the homeowners, this never would have worked. This was all about the human aspect of this program. Again, the technologies weren't all that superior. This was human power. I mean, this was just our staff working with the citizens of Miami Bay and Broward counties, uh, pulling in the same direction to get something done. So uh, I really appreciate the time. I appreciate you all being out here. Again, chalk one up for the good guys. We don't get too many of these in Florida. So thank you very much. Questions regarding the giant African land snail eradication program. Dr. Smith, you guys use the term eradicate or eradication, but the snail came back. You know, this is the second time, right? It's it. So, how, how confident are you in using that term? And are you sure that it won't come back, whether it's hitchhiking on freight or whatever? Right. So, the first, the actual, the 1969 event was actually a child went to Hawaii, picked up three giant African land snails and brought them home to his grandmother here in Miami. She promptly tossed them out in the garden. Next thing we know, we had a multi-million dollar eradication program. But there's no doubt at all, no doubt at all that by 1975, that population was eradicated. So we've gone quite some time uh, without another introduction. So I think, as Mr. Miranda was saying earlier, I think if we stay vigilant, if we're really on top of this, and it's not just about the ports, this is the pet trade. This is something people like these things as pets. I know that might sound odd. They do have a lot of personality. They're kind of like a little puppy dog when you look at them uh, in the face, but it's a very popular pet in Europe, in fact. Again, it is absolutely illegal. So I think uh, we've got to constantly be vigilant, but the good news is, We've got the strategy. So if we do have another outbreak and we can catch it early enough, we can do this much, much quicker. It certainly won't take 11 years. We find it early enough and we can knock it out quickly. And I, it looks like this has mostly been a Miami Day problem. How big a problem was it in Broward and Palm Beach County? It was very minor in Broward. We only had one population core in Southern Broward. Uh, everything else was in Miami Day. But one thing I'll, I'll also point out is we weren't willing to just say this thing's eradicated in Florida and only survey down here in Miami Dade and Broward. We actually surveyed, we have hundreds and hundreds of inspectors out there in our nurseries every single day. They've got a picture of this. They're looking for this. We've got 56,000 fruit fly traps that both the USDA and the FDAX DPI are out of every two weeks from Pensacola to Florida City. Every one of those trappers has a picture of this and they're looking for it. So through this whole program, we've actually had a blitz going on throughout the state of Florida, making sure that we didn't miss something in another part of the state, but it was 99% concentrated right down Miami Bay. And Mr. Miranda, in Spanish, please. In Spanish? No, 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 Snail? Correct. Okay. So it, it resets every time. We find a live snail, it resets to three years. Okay. Se mirando las claves para lograr esta erradicación. ¿Cuáles fueron los puntos más fuertes que estaban haciendo? La clave más importante para la erradicación de esta plaga fue la colaboración que existió entre la, 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 los dos departamentos de cultura federal y estatal um, y el público. Sin la ayuda del público, la colaboración que recibimos de, de miles y miles de, de residentes en el sur de la Florida fue la clave que nos permitió poder estar hoy aquí celebrando esta, esta erradicación. Y finalmente, ¿qué tan complejo, qué tan difícil es esta erradicación? ¿Cuáles son las partes más difíciles? Bueno, una de las partes más, más, más difíciles de esta erradicación es eh, la biología de, de estos caracoles. Eh, el color les da camu camuflaje. Eh, cuando hace mucho calor durante el día, estos caracoles se, se, se entierran en la, en la tierra y básicamente son imposibles de encontrar. 
¿ah? así que eso eso encima más no hay eh, una no hay una no, no hay tecnología que existe que sea muy efectivo en, en, en atraer los caracoles y de ahí matarlos o sea un veneno por ejemplo hay venenos pero no, no son tan efectivos como, como quisiéramos por lo tanto nosotros tuvimos que depender de nuestros inspectores que vayan de propiedad en propiedad y recoger la mayoría de, estas, de estos caracoles a mano. Y eso fue facilitado por los caninos, por los perros que tenemos, que nos ayudaron para encontrar esos, estos uh, caracoles que son, eh, que están camuflajeados y también enterrados en la tierra. You know, of course, uh, this started under Commissioner Putnam, uh, so I also want to recognize his work uh, while he was Commissioner of Agriculture, making sure that there was enough resources from the state um, in partnership with the federal government. So, um, so thank you again to Commissioner Putnam for showing leadership also onto this program. Um, but of course, this is this is important. Uh, this is important for our economy. This is important for our, our local um, communities, and, and of course, you know, for our farmers. Because if you see where all of the, the snails were found, that's the heart of a lot of our Dade County agriculture community. And so if there was a time that the international community was not going to purchase products from the United States because of this or from South Florida, it would have really decimated the agricultural industry of, of Dade County. So this was something that was really important. You know, it was actually one of the first things I, when I came in as commissioner, um, came over and, and actually held one of these because um, I wanted to know exactly what this was. It wasn't enough for me just to support the program to, underst to truly understand the impact uh, that these little guys were having on our communities um, and the work that was being done by DPI. Uh, so it is something that has been really important for us to continue asking for state and federal funding uh, to make sure that, that partnership um, was uh, as effective as possible and of course giving complete uh, support to our DPI industry to make sure that we are doing this together. Uh, and so today is an exciting day. Uh, I know that when I was first came in and, and saw these little guys, we, we were ta we were talking about that we're getting close. Uh, and so it's been exciting to see kind of the progress and to know that we've had three years uh, of no snail detection and can actually declare eradication. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you again for being here today. <laughs> Thank you again for being here today. My contact information is on the back of the program if there are any further questions. Have a great day.